Okay, um, before Tzvi begins, I, I was asked to remind you to fill out this thing, <clears throat> participation questionnaire, which is in your packets about uh, participating in the trip to Mitzada um, and the party and the tour of the old city. So you should fill this out. Everyone, including speakers. Um, so our first lecture is Tzvi Byrne from UCLA, who is going to talk about the harmony of scattering amplitudes. Now, as you all know, Tzvi is sort of the prime leader of a, a movement that started 15 years ago? About 15 years ago to calculate scattering amplitudes in QCD. And I must say, at the time, I was truly impressed by his guts <laughs> and optimism and was had no faith at all that he would succeed in going beyond maybe two loops with enormous effort. And you know, I, I, I don't think I ever said a discouraging word to you, but... No. <laughs> but uh, what a waste of time. <laughs> Somebody has to do it better at Svi than me. That's how I felt. But it, what he's done, together with his collaborators in the last 15 years, is truly amazing. Uh, they've discovered tool after tool, method after method, can bold guess after bold guess, to develop new techniques for calculating scattering amplitudes in, not just in QCD, but in uh, supersymmetric gauge theories, and in quantum gravity. Now to how many loops? We're sitting at five. We're sitting at five, and you know, when he says they're gonna do We're nine, gonna, yeah. or <laughs> all, <laughs> I tend to take it much more seriously. And uh, these new techniques and results have shed enormous light on the duality that I was talking about and on um, our understanding of gauge theories, both supersymmetric and non-supersymmetric. Not only is this beautiful, it's important and useful. I mean, this is really the basis of the modern calculations of background at, uh, for the LHC. So it is a great pleasure that Tzvi is going to give us a series of lectures on the methods. And after listening to him, you'll all be able to do three loop amplitudes <laughs> overnight. Well, I hope to do that as an example. <laughs> OK. OK, thanks a lot for the very nice introduction. It's a really a great pleasure to be here in Israel uh, and to give these lectures. Uh, I do apologize for this blackboard, but there's nothing I can do about that. Um, but anyway, I'll try to do my best. Uh, clearly, you want to move forward if you haven't done so already. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, uh, the first I'll start with some kind of an overview, just some propaganda. Uh, and actually, Nima is coming, so I figure I should do propaganda before he does. But uh, hi, Nima. OK, anyway. Um, then uh, we'll get down to the nuts and bolts. So one of the key things, because this is a school, I want to actually teach you how to do something. So uh, what today's lecture I hope to do is show you how to do tree level calculations in QCD or supersymmetric theories. And I'm going to work out a four point uh, example. And then for homework, I give you to do an infinite number of points. OK? Uh, and these techniques are really that powerful. If today you can do four, tomorrow you do five, and then you just keep on going. Um, at, at least at tree level loops, of course, that's a little bit more complicated. But again, what I want to do is work out some examples to show you exactly how these calculations are done. Now, obviously, I can't really go, you know, fully into exactly how it's done, but I can show you a couple things in, in some detail on the blackboard you know, to really teach you how to do this. Uh, and then uh, by the third lecture, I hope to be sitting around here, a case study 
I want to show you something really remarkable that you can learn by thinking about uh, scattering amplitudes in this modern approach, and that's a very curious relationship between color and kinematics, which I believe is really extremely important for thinking about gravity. And in fact, uh, I was not joking. I hope that by the fourth lecture, I am actually showing you in some detail a three loop computation of in n equals four supersymmetric Yang Mills. That's, of course, as David said, that's the uh, hydrogen atom. Uh, here's the harmonic oscillator, n equals eight supergravity. Okay. So, um, so I, I, there's really been a fantastic. Um, advance in our understanding of scattering amplitudes. Uh, some people would say revolution. People like to throw around the revolution. Uh, but as soon as you hear any words like that, you should ask two questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, what do we learn? <laughs> and what I believe to be a much more quest, a mu much more important question is what can we calculate? What have we calculated that people have wanted to calculate for a long time but have been unable to do? Uh, <coughs> now assuming that Nima is actually going to be talking about n equals four super symmetric Yang Mills, I was hoping to learn from David's talk what Nima will be talking about, but let's assume he will. Uh, then, between me and Nima, we're going to beat these two questions to death. I'm going to show you examples, really non-trivial examples of what, what we can do. And then I'm going to also show you uh, not very non-trivial examples of what we learn about basic facts of the theory. And that's something that Nima is going to completely pound to death. If you let him go, he's going to talk 10 hours at a time. So you'll get four lectures at 10 hours, that's 40 hours. Uh, now, there's a very basic change in the philosophy of how we do things. Uh, so, in the old way, what do we do? We start with a Lagrangian. And then we think about gauge fixing and we think about off shell quantities. We think off shell. There's Green's functions, there's a whole procedure of how to do renormalization. It's all done off shell and so on. Um, and, and then we focus also on symmetries of the Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian really plays a central role. In the new way, the new is we focus on the scattering amplitudes directly. The, uh, the Lagrangian and the Feynman rules, they're banished. Actually, those of us who wor work in the field, we're only allowed to use Feynman rules in secret when no one is looking. Otherwise, we get booed. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's no Lagrangian in the new approach. And everything we think about in terms of on-shell quantities. And this is talking about scattering amplitudes here. OK, so uh, oh, I forgot to mention there's a list of, these are a list of review articles. Uh, it, it, these are the ones that are most closely related to the ones, to the uh, topics I'll be talking about, although uh, there's many more review articles. Uh, I'm sure uh, Nima will mention more. Uh, this right here, Brito Cachazo Feng and Witten, that's not a review article, but it's a very short paper. So you can go read that. This is really a great paper. Uh, <coughs> okay. So, um, so let's start off with a little, uh, uh, like, uh, I don't know what to call it, maybe we'll call it propaganda, uh, because l let me just I'll be upfront about, you know, uh, just some comments about the types of things that we can now calculate that would have been very difficult, if not impossible, just a uh, few years ago. Um, so, <coughs> Uh, in uh, people who work in n equals four super Yang Mills, they're really excited about new symmetries and new structures. Uh, so if you look at um, at uh, uh, n equals four super Yang Mills in particular, 
just an amazing number of structures. Some of these symmetries you can't see in the Lagrangian. Uh, they're completely opaque, if not impossible to see within the Lagrangian. Uh, and, and this is, uh, I'm sure Nima will talk about this uh, for quite, quite a bit. Uh, and I'm also going to uh, talk about uh, new structures that really allow us to calculate. See, the good thing in this game is if you want to, if you're looking at something, you see a structure and you're trying to decide is it important, you just have to ask the question, does it help you calculate? If the answer is yes, then it's going to be important. Okay, if it's no, it's, then it's unclear. Okay, the other example which I will at least show you just some examples, obviously next to leading order QCD at the state of the art is something I can't do on a blackboard, nor can I even do it in transparency uh, in, in the limited time, but anyway, next to leading order QCD is uh, one place where it's really had a tremendous impact in collider physics. We can now do calculations that we've wanted to do for 20 years and uh, we've now done them and more are coming. And I will show you, uh, so this is for, for the LHC and it's the real deal. It's, uh, it's uh, really computations that people uh, want. <coughs> okay, um, by people I mean experimenters. So it's the real thing. I mean what theorists want, okay, but uh, uh, the, the, if, you're doing, if you're doing NLO QCD and it's not of interest to the experiments, then you're probably wasting your time. You really should uh, do that, uh, you know, connect to the experiments. Okay, and then uh, something which uh, I'm actually very amused uh, that people in the field consider this to be a triviality now, but if you go back, say, five, six years, and you say, oh, uh, we've uh, resummed n equals four supersymmetric gang nils, uh, four point function. And we've done it to all loop orders, resummed the thing, made the strong coupling prediction. Uh, so n equals uh, uh, four point, uh, so all loops. <coughs> strong coupling, weak coupling. And then uh, if you, if you, um, if you, um, uh, if you said uh, five or six years ago that uh, we, we were going to do this, people would say, oh no, it's impossible. You can't do infinite orders of perturbation theory. But in fact, we have done it. Uh, this is something called, uh, it goes with the initials BDS. It's an ansatz. Uh, unfortunately, this ansatz, notice I said four point. It doesn't, it doesn't work beyond six points and beyond, but that's something that's really a very active area of research. Okay, and then uh, if you look uh, at the question of supergravity, uh, you may notice uh, David mentioned that you know, supergravity has all these ultraviolet problems. Well, the question is, how do we know that? Well, to really know it, we have to calculate. We have to actually do the calculation and see what's going on with, uh, with the supergravity theories at high loop orders. Uh, so let me just say it's reopened this question. And it's reopened the question the old-fashioned way that we now have the ability to do computations and show that statements people make are wrong or they're right. Okay, okay now the next, uh, so this is, the, these are things that have been done. Now, the, the kinds of things that um, you, could, you could say, uh, okay, okay, well, where is this going? And uh, I think the answer, the answer to, uh, to where it's going is if in the next couple of years I think the following is going to happen. Of course I can't guarantee anything. The, the future is uncertain, especially when it relies on people being clever enough to make even better guesses. Uh, but I'm pretty sure we're going to solve uh, n equals four planar uh, all the scattering amplitudes. I think this is really in the cards, and then it's going to go well beyond that. <coughs> I, I mean, I, I mean, this is harder to see, but uh, I think uh, you know, correlation functions, even a lot about nonplanar, I think is going to happen in the next couple of years. Um, and then I'm pretty sure. Uh, oh, uh, so 
sorry, th this should say supergravity. Uh, uh, UV. Okay, I, I think the next couple of years we're going to settle the UV, the UV properties. And then, of course, in QCD, much more is coming. Uh, people are now talking about next to next to leading order. Uh, and, of course, there's going to be a lot more next to leading order QCD. And uh, I'm sure Nima is going to spend a lot of time talking about how these new ideas are going to lead to a fundamental reformulation of gauge and gravity theory. Now, what exactly he means by that, I think we have to await his lecture. Okay, so here I want to get down to the nuts and bolts, which is um, number two. So we're going to talk about on-shell recursion. Okay, and the um, basic idea of the on-shell recursion is uh, this is a formalism uh, which gets an endpoint amplitude by, there's going to be a sum over certain diagrams, and let me just draw these diagrams. Uh, in the following way, like so. So this is tree level. Um, so you're building a endpoint amplitude by summing over like factorization channels here. And the key point is this guy is going to be on shell. Actually, let me point here. This guy and these guys are on-shell scattering amplitudes. And this is an on-shell scattering amplitude. So there's no virtual particles off-shell states. This is all done in terms of physical quantities. The only uh, odd thing is those physical quantities will be in the complex plane. They're going to be scattering amplitudes which are analytically continued into the complex plane. Um, it, there, in fact, I believe everybody here needs to go and learn this because this will be textbook material. I already have evidence that that's a true statement because Tony Z, uh, his quantum field theory in a nutshell, um, it, it's, it's got four chapters, but that's the second edition. If you have the first edition, you should throw it away by the second edition. I do get a kickback from Tony. Um, now, now, what are the basic ideas that go into this? Um, so the first thing is uh, Cauchy's theorem. I hope this is readable. This doesn't look readable to me, but okay. Um, I see people in the front row are nodding, but probably people in the back row are not, but okay. Um, the second is basic factorization. Uh, it's just the same diagram I just wrote over there. If you have an amplitude in quantum field theory, and this leg here happens to go on shell, right here, then the amplitude breaks into two pieces. That's called factorization. Uh, that's very basic in quantum field theory. Feynman diagrams, have, have, of course, have this property. If they did not, then there would be a problem with the Feynman diagrams, in the sense this property is even more fundamental than, than Feynman diagrams. Okay, and the third, the third is the concept of complex momenta, complex uh, deformations.
And the idea is we take the momenta and we now make them functions of z. z is a complex parameter. Uh, the reason why you need this complex parameter is because Cauchy's theorem needs a complex parameter to apply it. Uh, and then the idea is that we leave uh, these, we do this deformation in such a way that everything remains on shell and, uh, and also momentum conservation holds um, so, <clears throat> so that we have a, what we call a physical amplitude except that we are now in the complex plane. Okay. Now, before I begin the description of uh, these recursion relations, oh, I think I, well, I did mention it earlier, but this is, these are called, this is a Brito Cacciazzo thing and Witten are the originators of this. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, sorry, so before I begin my, my, uh, my uh, uh, description of, of uh, these recursion relations, uh, I need s some basic tools. Uh, there's two things we have to talk about. One is spinner variables. Uh, if I don't use spinner variables, I can't put it on the blackboard. And the other is the, the, uh, um, uh, to discuss color. Basically, I'm going to say very little about color, but just to say, oh, let's not worry about color. No questions? Okay. Okay. So let's talk about spinner variables. So it's been known for more than 25 years that the proper way to discuss to describe um, amplitudes is in terms of spinner variables, not momenta. Um, and the basic way to do this is what you want to do is take um, a polarization vector, let's say of spin one, and you can do the same for spin two or spin, spin three halves. You can play the same games. Uh, for spin one half, you don't have to bother because everything's in terms of spinners anyway. Uh, but let's take the polarization vector so this would be, let's call it, let's say, a gluon polarization. And this could be in a supersymmetric theory, um, for example. And we're going to have a momentum K. Uh, so this is gluon momentum. And over here, this is, we'll call a reference momentum. And um, this reference momentum, we're going to make it satisfy Q squared equals zero, and also it being a gluon in perturbation theory, of course, K squared is zero. So that's the on-shell conditions. Uh, and then uh, the spinner helicity formula says that this is plus minus uh, Q minus plus uh, gamma mu K minus plus divided by the square root of two uh, Q minus plus uh, K plus minus. Okay, these guys here are vile spinners. So there's a helicity projection. That's what the labels here mean. So th these labels are helicity labels. So it's the two polarization states of the gluon. Um, and these spinners, if I have a spinner I plus minus, well, we could write it as Ki plus minus. So you see it's just the index, like the, the there's an index, uh, let's say like leg number one, maybe I'll do that, this kind of notation. Um, so here I'm using momenta, but we could just use the index. Uh, and then this, uh, we can, just write in terms of a chiral projector, one plus gamma five U of K. And this spinner here is just the spinner of Bjorken and Drell or Peskin and Schroeder. So, so far there's nothing really fancy here. 
Uh, you could think of this as taking a spin one object and writing it in terms of spin one half objects. It's not uh, especially profound, um, but the consequences and the use of this is in fact very profound. Um, so the, the key thing, if there's any thing I want to get across, it's spinner variables are better. No one in his right mind would open up his, his mouth about n equals 4 super yang mills uh, without using spinner variables. Okay, and then we're going to use a notation. Uh, you know, one of the uh, names of the game here is he uses better and better notation. So let me define uh, an inner product ij is by definition. So if I write something like that, which I will, then I mean this spinner inner product like so. And if I write a square, square bracket like so, ij, then by definition I mean, I mean this one of the opposite helicity. Okay, and then we can also write this directly in terms of spinner variables, uh, in, in terms of the spinners themselves, uh, we can write, let's say, 1, 2 is epsilon a, b, lambda 1, a, lambda 2, b. So you can see here the anti-symmetry. This is an anti-symmetric anti product. Okay, 1, 2, the square bracket, we can write in a similar way. Uh, using the dot notation to indicate the other chirality. We'll put a twiddle here to indicate it's the opposite helicity spinner. So this guy is going to be a positive helicity spinner. That guy is a negative helicity spinner. Um, and then uh, one a dot lambda two twiddle two. Uh, uh, board has a nail in it. It made my B look funny, but okay, there it is. Um, and then there's certain uh, identities that we need. Uh, they're going to be homework assignment to prove these things. Uh, spinners. These are the spinners themselves. Uh, yeah, the, it's really the same as this. Different notation. It's really the same object. Okay. So this is that's just a spinner. And the plus the the two the plus and the minus uh, they refer to. Uh, this and this. Okay. Uh, now there's a one thing I'm going to use in a few spots. Uh, it's called the Fiertz identity. I'm not going to prove this. Let me just write it down. Uh, C minus gamma mu uh, d minus. Okay, and the Fiertz identity is that this is two uh, a d. A D, and then uh, no, that's wrong. Uh, a C, and then uh, uh, D B. Okay. Um, and then maybe one more identity that we need. Uh, so I J, and then uh, J L. I'm going to write as uh, I minus. Um, and then KJ, maybe I'll put in the slash, and then L, like so. Okay, and then maybe I'll drop the slash after a while. Okay, and we're going to be using these two things uh, in a few spots. Um, and maybe uh, one more important thing is uh, these things, uh, IJ, uh, it behaves like it's proportional to, there's also a phase which I'm going to ignore, but it behaves like the square root of 2ki dot kj, okay, times a phase. It's proportional to that. Uh, so these guys are square roots of Lorentz inner products. Okay, so that's the first thing. Uh, spinner variables are better. Uh, basically, every important discovery, pretty much, uh, maybe that's an exaggeration, but uh, spinners really play a central role in almost every, every development. Um, okay, the next thing after the spinners, let's talk about color and then we're going to get started. So 
So a color is one of those things that if you don't treat it properly, it completely confuses the situation. It's not, color is not such a big deal. We all know uh, it's uh, described by Lie algebra and we learn in graduate school all about the color factors and the color factors and the Feynman rules. But uh, it's mainly like an organization to get rid of the color so you can ignore the color. If you don't do that, at least in many cases, then um, things can get uh, very confused. Uh, now, actually, later on I'm going to show you one example where the color plays a central role in what I'll be talking about. Uh, but but that's, uh, it's still a true statement that in general you don't want to deal with color, you want to get rid of it. And uh, let's talk about SU, SUNC. Okay. Uh, then uh, color, of course, the color matrices, of course, uh, satisfy a Lie algebra. That's what they do for a living. Uh, I, F, A, B, C, and then T, C, and then uh, trace T, A, T, B is equal to delta A, A, B. No, that is not a mistake. I don't have a one-half here on purpose. If you look at Peskin and Schroeder or elsewhere, there's a one-half, uh, but that's uh, not the right way to do it. This is the right way. So it's just a normalization. Okay. Um, okay, now, um, Generally, what we're going to do uh, at tree level, especially, is we're going to do something called color ordering. And what color ordering is, is basically, if you turn the, uh, the uh, adjoint representation matrices, the FABCs, the structure constants, you turn them into fundamental representation matrices uh, just using a standard standard identity, just a difference of two traces, trace T A uh, T B T C minus trace, uh, and then the other way around, T C, T C, T B, and then T A. Reverse it with a minus sign. Okay, and then what you do is you, re you replace this with this. Uh, and then there are some fierce identities, and you can anyway clean it up. Let me give you the punchline. Uh, and if you want to learn more about this, uh, the first article, review article I had from Lance Dixon, that's the one to look at. Uh, the whole purpose of this is to learn enough about color in order to ignore it. That's the, that's the key here. Because like I say, uh, uh, color generally confuses things. Okay, so the, the formula we're going to use throughout, and Nima is, I'm sure, going to do exactly the same. He will talk about color stripped or color ordered amplitudes. Um, so let's say at, uh, at n points, uh, and let's label the legs 1, 2, n. So we have some amplitude. There's some number of gluons coming in, some number of gluons going out. Okay, and then the, uh, the formula is that this is the sum over permutations uh, permutations of trace uh, TA1, TA2, all the way to TA, TAN, okay, and then times what we're going to call partial amplitudes. A N 1 all the way to N. And the key difference, this is again tree level here, uh, the key difference between this side is this is the full amplitude and this we will call a partial amplitude. Now the important thing about this partial amplitude is it's gauge invariant. That's actually very important because if it was not a gauge invariant quantity, uh, then this would not be an interesting quantity to look at. And in fact, this is what you want to focus on on tree level. Once you know this, this object here, then it's pretty easy to get that. You just have to multiply by these color factors and then uh, do the sum. Now, the first example where you can really see that spinner variables are better is what's called the Park-Taylor amplitude. And it, the Park-Taylor amplitude is written in terms of this partial amplitude, in terms of the uh, the uh, color stripped amplitudes. Uh, 
Okay, so this would be uh, Park Taylor. And in fact, the homework assignment will be to derive these equations, uh, to basically do the calculation. Um, and uh, the Park-Taylor formula says the following, that if we have a tree amplitude, 1 minus, 2 minus, um, and then let's make them the rest all of positive helicity. Okay, and by the way, my notation is that everything is outgoing. Uh, sometimes when you look in the literature, then some particles are incoming, like in an experiment, and that flips the helicity. And if you don't know that fact, you can get yourself very confused if you look at the literature. Okay. Uh, so the Park-Taylor formula says that at any number of legs, this is equal to, uh, there's an I, which is just the phase, and then 1, 2 to the fourth, divided by 1, 2, 2, 2 3, and then N1. Uh, now notice it cancels, but I want to leave it like this to, to uh, make, expose the pattern. And this is called uh, MHV, maximal helicity violating. Uh, amplitudes, if you put uh, either two pluses here or one minus and the rest plus, they vanish. So this is the first non-vanishing one. Uh, there's the, what we call the anti-MHV. So we'll make this plus, plus, three minus, and then n minus, like so. And that's just given by the conjugation of this, just essentially the complex conjugation. Uh, so it's the opposite chirality spinners, which for real momenta, it's just the complex conjugate. And then, oops, square brackets. Okay. Okay, so now I think it should be obvious to you that spinners are better. Uh, the idea of being able to write down what would be an infinite number of Feynman diagrams in one line like this, okay, it's a special case, but the idea that you could do this is just unbelievable. Okay, but this formula has been known uh, for 25 years or so. So, like I say, it's been known for a very long time that spinners are the proper variables to use if you want to think about uh, scattering amplitudes. Actually, today, you know, there's, you can go beyond spinners, but at least very basic variables uh, to be thinking about. Uh, there, there's, uh, you know, uh, well, at least in n equals four super Yang mills, there's much better variables than these. But generically, these would be the right variables. Okay. Hmm. Uh, if you write all the Feynman diagrams, add them up, you will get this answer. Uh, now, you can't do that, right? No one can do that, no computer. But like I say, this will be a homework assignment for you to prove this. And we're going to show, I'll show you the, how to do it. Okay. Yeah, so what the amplitude looks like depends on the helicity. Uh, for example, if I were to move this minus, let's just move it to number three, but let's leave the rest plus, then this becomes a three. Okay, so it's, it's actually quite simple. Uh, to go beyond this, the next, like next to MHV, next to next to MHV, uh, it, it's in fact, uh, the solution is known. It's not as pretty as this formula, but there is a solution for all the tree amplitudes of uh, pure Yang mills and also for n equals four super Yang mills, a complete solution at tree level. But, but basically, you don't take more than the helicities. Yeah, the, what the amplitude is depends depends on the specific helicities. Um, if you try to mangle it all together in some way, then it gets much more confused. Okay. Uh, and th this thing we'll call MHV bar. Uh, it's uh, sometimes called googly. Uh, those of you who know cricket, then will know where that word comes from. Okay. So uh, one of the things you learn in this game very quickly is that cheating is very important. Now, what do I mean by cheating? So let's say you're trying to figure out uh, some new idea. It's like, oh, I think I can do this by 
on-shell recursion, or I think that uh, you know, color does something. What you do is you take the data, and there's a lot of data, not data like experimental data, but theoretical data, and you analyze the data, and you see if your idea or intuition is actually correct or not. So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to uh, have a look, uh, basically reverse engineer. We know this answer. We've known it for 25 years, and we're going to reverse engineer it, and we're going to inspect how this thing behaves in the complex plane under, under, uh, under shifts. So, uh, if you look at how this was arrived at, it's pretty convoluted, but, but uh, at the end, it's, it's actually quite simple. So, consider the following. A complex deformation. So I'm going to take uh, K1 mu of Z and what I'm going to do to it is I'm going to uh, write it as K1 uh, minus Z over 2 um, and then uh, 1 minus gamma mu 2 minus. I hope this is readable. This doesn't look so good to me, but okay. Oh, sorry, there's a mu here. At least I can make typos and no one will spot them, so. <laughs> yeah, I guess it looks okay. Um, okay, so uh, we make this deformation like so, and then I'm going to shift another leg. So num no, leg number one, leg number two gets shifted. Uh, this is K2 plus Z over 2, uh, 1 minus gamma mu uh, 2 minus. Now the first thing to notice is that I made it so momentum conservation holds. If I, if, if I take uh, K1 goes to K1 of Z and K2 goes to K2 of Z, notice that the momentum conservation is okay. If it was not okay, th this would not be useful because then I wouldn't have a physical amplitude that satisfies momentum conservation. The next thing I'm going to do is... Hmm? Oh, yes. I, I was testing. Very good. Thank you. Maybe I shouldn't test. <laughs> uh, okay. So, uh, uh, the next thing is we need the on shellness condition. So, we know that K1 square is equal to zero. That's the on shell condition. K2 square is equal to zero. And the question is, what does this thing do? So, let's just square it. So, so K1 of z squared is equal to k1 squared minus z and then 1 minus and then I have uh, k1 slash 2 minus and then I have uh, plus z over 2 squared and then it's 1 minus gamma mu 2 minus squared. So first thing is we see that this is zero. Next thing, notice the K1 slash up against the spinner. So this guy is zero. And then this guy here is also zero by a Fierce identity. So I'll leave that as a homework assignment to just make sure that the Fierce identity that I wrote down actually gives zero, but anyway, it does. So that's zero. That means this remains on shell. So now I'm in the promised land. Actually, I am in the promised land, but because you see, if I have a complex parameter z in my amplitude and I'm thinking I want to construct it recursively, then immediately I start thinking about Cauchy's theorem. Right. So that's what we're going to do. Oh, but uh, before, before we get to Cauchy's theorem, uh, there's a better way to rewrite it. Notice that I violated my own statement. I said uh, the right way to think about uh, amplitude is not with, in terms of momenta, but to think about it in terms of spinners. Okay, so why am I writing it in terms of momenta? Well, it's just to show you there's nothing fancy going on here. Uh, in terms of spinners, uh, let's write down the same thing. Uh, we'll write that lambda 1 uh, twiddle of z is equal to lambda 1 twiddle minus z lambda 2. That's the, that's the shift. 
um, that we're going to make. And then lambda 1, lambda 2 of z is going to be lambda 2 plus z lambda 1. So it's this asymmetric shift that I make. Okay. Uh, and now um, we want to apply Cauchy's theorem, but I'm from the school of uh, before you do anything, uh, you know, work out an example backwards where we know the answer and then we're going to see how we can use Cauchy's theorem uh, by looking at the known example. So, um, so we're going to cheat by working backwards. Okay? So let's look at a four-point amplitude. So A4, 1 minus, 2 minus, 3 plus, 4 plus, uh, that's one of the Park-Taylor amplitudes. Okay, I know the answer offhand, just 1, 2 to the fourth. And then uh, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1. Okay? Uh, and then what I'm going to do is we're working backwards, so I'm going to take this amplitude, apply the shift, and I'm going to have a look at what happens. I hope you can write fast because I keep on erasing things. So if I now look at the amplitude A of Z, so that's using the shifted momenta, right, then um, it's pretty simple. I just have the spinners here. See, there's, there's like a uh, here there's a lambda 2 spinner, okay, and uh, lambda 2 spinners. So those undergo shifts. Notice there's no square bracket. Remember the uh, lambdas are like angle brackets and lambda tildes are like square brackets, okay. So uh, only the second guy affects this amplitude. So I just carry it out. I just do the shift. So that's equal to I. And then it's 1, 2 to the 1, 2, and then the sh there's a shift, z, and then it's 1, 1. See, leg 2, spinner 2 gets shifted by spinner 1. So I get z, and then instead of the 2, I get a 1, and that's to the fourth power. And then I get, uh, well, actually, if I was smart, let's make a cube power. Okay, and then I get, uh, in the denominator, I get uh, a 2, 3 plus z, angle 1, 3, and then 3, 4, and then 4, 1, okay? Um, and now I look up here and I say, wait a second, angle 1, 1, I know what that is. That's zero because it's an anti-symmetric inner product, so that's zero. That's a good thing because you see the z in the numerator, that guy could cause trouble because now, when I look at this, I see that A of Z goes like 1 over Z. It behaves like 1 over Z. If it behaves like 1 over Z, then it's obvious what you need to do. You want to write down a contour integral, which surrounds infinity because it'll vanish at infinity. So what you do is you write down immediately this identity. This is now true by Cauchy's theorem that the integral off at infinity of dz over z, a of z, is equal to zero. Because this thing goes like 1 over z and then off at the boundary there's nothing to be found. Now, last I checked, there's a residue theorem which says Okay. There's something about the coefficient of friction on this blackboard. Oh, I know what it is. There's a nail there. Okay. Okay, so uh, from Cauchy's theorem now, you see we have to just collect all the poles. Well, I can see two poles. One at z equals zero because I put that in by hand. And then there's another one here. Right? So that means that uh, from here, I immediately get a of zero is the sum over the poles uh, alpha, let's label them by alpha, there's only one of them, so that sum isn't going to run over more than one pole. And then it says the residue at z equals z alpha of a of z over z. 
Okay? Now notice that A of zero is really what we're interested in. Now I keep on calling A of Z a physical amplitude, but between you and me, you know, we don't do scattering in the, in, in, with complex momenta at colliders, right? So we're really interested in this guy. But this is the recursion formula. It allows you to get this amplitude that we're interested in, in terms of poles in the complex plane corresponding to the physical factorizations. So if I see a pole here, I know where it comes from. It comes from something that looks like this. Uh, in, in, in the complex plane, this is going to be uh, oops, uh, 2, 3, 4, 1. So it's in the 2, 3 channel that I see this pole corresponding to this. So this will be 1 over actually angle 2, 3, square 2, 3 or 3, 2. Uh, that's, just, that's just the momentum invariant. This, this guy cancels against stuff in the numerator. He's not there. But this guy is the remaining pole that we see in the complex plane. Um, and in fact, from here we can now see a general um, idea. If I'm interested in the endpoint amplitude, what I need is the residue of lower point on shell amplitudes. Right? This, is a, this is now, we're sitting on top of that pole. It's all, we placed it off in the complex plane, but we're sitting right on top of that pole. So this amplitude now factorizes into a product of two. So there's a three-point amplitude on shell times another three-point amplitude on shell. Okay, and in fact, this very quickly leads to um, the following general recursion formula. This is the on-shell recursion relation. It says A is zero, so that's what we're interested in. We have to sum over some labels which I'll define. So it'll be uh, a, uh, yeah, let's put it like this. and then S, and then R. Okay, so labels J and L tell me which legs I shifted. They are on opposite sides of the propagator because if J and L are not the shifted legs, I wouldn't have Z going through here. Okay, so, um, and then uh, R and S are just labels that you have to sum over. See, there's the sum over R, at R and S, so that's these labels. Basically, you have to sum over all the factorizations such that the shifted legs, that's what the hats mean. The hat means shifted. Such that the shifted legs um, are on opposite sides. And then I have to sum over the different helicities that cross the pole. So there's different particles that can go across the pole. So I have to sum over all particles. So this is the helicities. Or actually, I should really call it states. Uh, the same trickery works in D dimensions, by the way. Okay, uh, so, uh, so the, then the sum is over, um, let's call it a left amplitude. I'll pull an, put an L here and a right amplitude. So these are lower point amplitudes. Uh, it, it's got some helicity label. That's the left guy. And this here is, th is going to be uh, the sum over the location of the pole, which I'll ex just say a little bit more about in just a minute. And then uh, you have a propagator. Uh, so this is, this is KRS, so this is the momentum going down that pole. And this is squared. Uh, and then there's a left, uh, right guy, uh, Z equals ZRS. Now, with residues, you might remember that you're supposed to freeze the variable z at the location of the pole. So if I happen to have a residue of some f of z, z minus z0, and I'm interested in the residue at z equals z0, then what you do is this is just uh, f of z0. You just plug in the frozen value. 
Uh, that's where this is coming from. Now, the location of these guys, maybe the best way to show you is by an example. Where is that, where is that guy located? Uh, actually, in our four-point example, we can see where he's located, right? This guy, this, at the four-point example, you can see that we have a Z, uh, uh, let's call him maybe like 2, 3, is equal to uh, minus angle 2, 3 over angle 1, 3. So it's just located somewhere in the complex plane, let's say right there, is, happens to be uh, a pole, um, which is the one that we have to sum over. And in, in general, in this case, there are many poles that we have to sum over. Okay, and the other side of the equation, this side here, it comes from, by hand, inserting a pole right there at the origin at z equals zero. Okay. So, so let me show you uh, maybe operationally what to do. Oh, by the way, uh, someone probably should have raised their hand and when I used the word uh, three-point amplitude. I said, oh, you get a three-point amplitude. Remember, these are massless particles. So let me ask you, what's the three-point amplitude of massless particles? Anybody can tell me? What's the probability of a, of a massless gluon moving along or a massless graviton moving along and decaying into two others with no other interactions? Zero, right, because it violates uh, uh, angular momentum conservation. But that's not going to stop us. That's a minor technicality. Uh, now, the reason why that happens is because we've limited ourselves to uh, real momenta. I mean, the reason why the three-point amplitude vanishes. Um, so, there's just a, a, a little, uh, this is an important technicality. Uh, which we should discuss, which is the three-point amplitude. Uh, so you have, let's say, something coming along and then it's decaying into two others. And if you check out the kinematics, you'll see it's in the collinear direction and then it violates uh, angular momentum conservation. Um, but uh, that's because we're not looking at it the right way. Uh, we should look at it from the use of complex momenta. So let's just say that I have three particles. There's one, two, and three. Right, and let's say I have k3 square equals zero, which is equal to k1 plus k2 square, which then I'm going to rewrite as, um, as, as uh, uh, angle 1, 2, square 2, 1, like so. And then I want this to be on shell, so that zero is equal to this. Now, if you have real momenta, if this guy vanishes, then that's just the complex conjugate. So this guy vanishes, right? But suppose you have complex momenta. If this guy vanishes, it doesn't mean that guy vanishes and vice versa. And it's in fact this factorization right here, which is a key trick that allows you to define amplitudes. If I have a three-point amplitude, all legs on shell, I can write it purely in terms of these guys with these guys vanishing or vice versa. So in fact, the three-point amplitudes are defined, this is now using complex momenta, so complex uh, momenta, which you might notice is completely natural in this game. Um, with complex momenta, we have that uh, 1, 2 is not equal to uh, 2, 1 uh, star. Uh, it's only true for real momenta. And then I'm going to define a three vertex using that. Uh, my three vertices are, in fact, the only possible thing you could write down. So I'll write down one minus, two minus, three plus. This is now for gluons. You can do the same for other particles. Uh, it'll be one, two cubed. And then uh, two, three, uh, two, three, and then uh, three, one. And then I have that the squares, like square 1, 2, etc., these all vanish. Square ij, it's pretty hard to read, sorry about that. Hmm. Anyway, square ij vanishes for this, and then we can also define a conjugate, uh, conjugate guys, where now uh, you put two plus helicities and you, def and you use the square brackets, but you have the angle brackets vanish. 
And this is perfectly happy and perfectly usable. Okay. Uh, and this is something important because you've got to have a place to start. Uh, without complex momenta, if you tried doing on shell recursion, you'd be stuck on line one. You try to build the four point out of the three points and zero, zero, zero. Right? Uh, complex momenta just dodges this problem. Okay. Um, okay, so let's get going. So let's go calculate the four point. I got 20 minutes to do the four point. Uh, I might be able to make it, uh, but let's give it a try. I think I need some coffee to do this. Mm. Maybe I started 10 minutes late, so maybe I have a half hour, but okay. Okay, so um, we want to compute, we want to compute uh, the four point starting from this. Let me write this down uh, so we have it handy. Although it won't, it won't be handy for long since I'm about to, er I'll, I'll probably erase it very shortly. But okay, there it is, two, three, uh, three, one. Um, so, Um, so let's compute. So now we're going to do it in the forwards direction. Before I was talking the backwards direction. I have the amplitude and then uh, the question is what is its properties? How do I write down a recursion relation? Now I have the recursion relation. So now I'm going to generate the four point amplitude starting from three points. So what do I do? Uh, first thing is um, I uh, write down some shifts. So we already know some good shifts. And there's some very simple rules for choosing these shifts. Uh, if you go look at any of the reviews, they'll tell you immediately what to do. Uh, just universal rules so you know ahead of time what shifts are allowed and which ones aren't. Okay, and then lambda 2 of z is equal to lambda 2 plus z uh, lambda 1. Uh, and then what I do is I consider all possible channels um, where I have uh, the shifted legs on opposite sides. So here's one example. So there's uh, 2 minus, put a hat here, there's 3 plus, um, then uh, 4 plus and then 1 minus. And I'm going to compute a 1 minus, 2 minus, 3 plus, 4 plus. Okay, and then uh, there's two possible helicities that can cross that pole. So maybe let's put this minus plus. So we'll call that diagram A. And then we're going to calculate uh, diagram 2. Right? These are like uh, a diagrammatic description. Okay. There's the second one, uh, and let me put a hat here. You see one and two are on the opposite sides. There's no other diagrams because we're or doing the color ordering. Uh, this is because we're looking at the coefficient of one color trace. We're looking at the coefficient of trace TA1 to TA4. So there's, you have to respect that ordering around here in those partial amplitudes. So that's one minus two, three, four. Okay, and it's the same except now I'm going to uh, have the opposite. So that's diagram B. Uh, and then what we have to do is go ahead and use that recursion formula uh, composed of these two diagrams. Now, um, first thing is where is the pole located? So you see I'm in the S23 channel. So we'll call S23 is equal to K2 plus K3 squared. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift it. So we're going to do our shift. And then what happens in, in our shift is we get 0 is equal to uh, K2, uh, K2 of Z. So this is 
I want to be on shell here. This will go on shell. There's a black hole in the blackboard. It won't let me. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's like oil or something. Uh, anyway, I, I need I need to put this intermediate leg on shell, uh, and this is uh, s two three of z. So now I've done that shift, and then I need to go on shell because that's where the residue is. Right, I'm collecting residue, so I have to locate that at the pole, and that pole happens when when uh, k two of z. Uh, 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 plus k3 uh, square is equal to zero. Okay, uh, so then let's locate it. So that's uh, k2 uh, mu plus z over 2, 1 minus gamma mu 2 minus. Okay, plus k3 mu, and let's square that. Okay, so now, uh, okay, now when I do the, the, the square, you can immediately see I pick up, uh, there's a term here, this thing's square, so we'll call that s23. Okay, and then there's some cross terms. This cross term with that, that's zero, because there's a k2 slash. This cross term with that is non-zero. This thing squared by itself is zero by the Fiertz. So that means I only pick up one term, and that's plus z. And then one minus k3 slash two minus. And then I just do a little bit of cleaning up on this thing, and I find that the pole is located, z is equal to z23, is equal to minus uh, angle 23 over angle 13 which is, of course, the right answer that we got by reverse engineering. But the idea is I, I need to find where the residues are located. Uh, and and uh, right, so that's the location of the pole. And that's what I needed in the on-shell recursion. I need to know the, val the location of the pole. And I just do it by just solving very quickly these on-shell conditions. Yes? Right. That's reverse. Right, right. right. I'm, I'm, do, I'm doing it right now. So I, I did, uh, like, a mo there's a moment of inspiration. That's in the BCFW paper. You write down the recursion relation. And from that point on, we, what we do is we just start calculating. And that's what I'm doing here. So the reverse engineering is to, is to give you an idea where the hell this thing comes from. Okay. But once we have the recursion relation, we go forward. So right now, at this point, the only input to get the four point will be the three points. Oh no, uh, I didn't prove it, but I'm just going to assert it. Uh, there's, there's lots of proofs in the literature of all sorts. Uh, the, the proofs are, can get uh, uh, a little bit opaque, but the final answer is pretty straightforward. Uh, you could say this is one of those examples that the w reason why people were able to construct all these proofs and write down the recursion relations and so on is because they knew where they were going. Lots of data showing that it all worked, and then people constructed the proofs of the recursion relations. Uh, it turns out for one specific configuration of shifts, you can even use Feynman diagrams to prove it. For other configurations, it's actually pretty hard to prove. You need some, some other ideas. Okay. Um, okay, so, uh, so we now have two diagrams to compute. Okay, so I've got uh, 10 minutes on this one, 10 minutes on that guy, so let's see if I can do it. So um, the thing is that when we write down the diagram, the first approximation, we already have the answer. The diagrams are the answer, assuming you know the lower point guy. Uh, so, because uh, the algebra, uh, so let's write down diagram A. See, diagram A would be A23, and then I put a hat, meaning I've shifted. Then there's 3 plus, so that's 2 minus. And then this will put a hat, uh, 2, 3 minus. Uh, this guy here is an on-shell momentum, even though it's composed of two of them, because the shift is what puts it on shell. So that's shifted and frozen to the location of the pole. Is, is this momentum here, and he's on shell. Okay, then I have k23, oh, let me, 
K23 uh, is K2 plus K3, in case you didn't say that. So we'll square that. And then A, uh, uh, this should not be 2, this is 3. That's a 3 point. Um, and then uh, that's a 3 point, and then 4 plus, and then the shifted, uh, and then that's uh, a minus, uh, and then uh, K23 shifted, and that's a plus helicity. So there's diagram A. And in some sense, this is already the answer. I don't really have to do anything. I just have to plug in uh, you know, the, the functional values, and that is actually the answer. Uh, but let's have a closer look at what exactly the value of this answer is. It's, uh, it's kind of amusing. Um, and uh, maybe to be a little bit more explicit, uh, K, uh, K23 with a hat, he is defined to be equal to K2 plus Z23 over 2 and then uh, 1 minus gamma mu 2 minus and then uh, plus K3. And this is by definition what I mean. So it's the shifted value frozen at the value uh, like you need for a residue. Okay, and then the, uh, let me just write down one of them, A3, 4 plus, 1 minus K2, 3 uh, is equal to minus I and then K2, uh, 3 hat and then the 4 cubed divided by uh, 4, 1 and then 1 K2, 3 hat. Okay, and that's the explicit value and you can immediately write down the other one as well. Uh, now, these hats are, are uh, you know, perfectly good memento. I mean, they're just some memento pointed in the complex plane, which are well defined. But uh, th th it's a little unusual. So you want to say, I, I want to know what that is without the hats. So what we need is a hat removal, like a hat removal program. People should take off their hats, except if you're religious, and leave it on. Um, So let's do hat removal. So suppose I have uh, a guy that looks like this. A and there's a K with a hat on him. Uh, I need some of that yellow chalk, but I think I'm out of luck. Oh, aha. Uh -huh. Maybe I'm in luck. OK, so, uh, so suppose I have this, and I want to clean this up. Then there's a simple trick. Uh, so let's. This is now the hat removal. And, and that's so we can make contact to the old answers. So with the hat removal, uh, the way the, the pro, uh, the, the, this hat removal program goes is what I'm going to do is multiply and divide by something. And I will multiply and divide by something special. Leg one, that's a shifted leg. Right? That, that's, the, that's the leg that got shifted. But anyway, I'm putting, this is, uh, or I should say was shifted. There's no hat on this guy, okay? Um, but anyway, he is the leg that got shifted, and I'm going to make use of that to help me. Okay, so I just multiplied and divided. These things are massless, so I can just use standard formulas. So that's equal to, um, so actually, let me just look at this product. Forget about the denominator. Uh, so k hat 1 uh, is equal to, uh, 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 this is, uh, actually it's the other way around, 1 minus, uh, uh, and then, um, let's, let's write this, I'll forget about the slash, and then a minus, and then I have another term that comes from the shift, because k is a shifted, is a shifted momentum, so then plus z over 2, and then 1 minus, gamma mu uh, a minus uh, and then times 1 minus gamma mu 2 minus. Okay, and, and uh, this term here, that's from the shift, right? But I want you to notice something, that Fiert's identity with a 1, 1 here, this thing vanishes. Okay, so I'm just looking at the numerator now and I use the fact that the 
the, but this thing just forms a K slash, and then I kind of turned it around um, to write it in a more standard form. But anyway, this guy vanishes by the fiats. So there's the hat removal program. If I want to remove the hat, I just multiply and, by, and divide by that. Okay, and then the hats start disappearing on me. Uh, and in fact, the rule is uh, we take a k hat uh, is equal to 1 minus, uh, and then k, and then a minus, and then divided by something I'll call omega bar. So omega bar is just going to be that denominator. So that's uh, k1. And then if I have the other guy, uh, a k hat, like uh, with the angles, then this will be a minus, sorry, I'm having some trouble here with the chalk. Uh, someone needs to fix this, I think. No, the, the blackboard doesn't, uh, yeah, and, and somehow the chalk is very hard, so it doesn't write, uh, it doesn't write very well. Uh, but anyway, I'll do my best. Uh, that's all you can ever do, is just do your best. Okay, and, and then uh, uh, this thing, uh, in this case, the hat removal, if you follow through the same logic, the hat removal looks like so, and then um, uh, the, the omega is going to be uh, it's going to be a, a, two, a, a 2k. And then uh, we need one more rule how to get rid of these omegas. Uh, there's, there is a simple reason that has to do with the, uh, angular momentum conservation, where, the, where it always turns out that the omegas and omega bars always balance. And then what you can do is this will give you 1k uh, 2 minus. So with these rules, we can get rid of the hats. So the first thing I want to do is now remove the hat from uh, this guy. You see here? This guy. I want to get rid of that hat. Okay, so um, if I remove the hat, so k hat 2, 3, and then 4, now, I just follow the rules. So uh, this thing is uh, 1 minus, and then it's k2, and I'll write it slash, plus k3 slash, uh, 4 minus, and then divided by this omega bar that I defined. Now you stare at that for a second and say, huh, isn't there a momentum conservation rule that says k2 plus k3 is equal to minus k4, k4 minus k1? So this is zero. Okay, I just computed diagram number one. It's zero. In fact, the reason why it's zero, there is a simple reason. It's because you're now located at a certain pole in the complex plane, and either the square brackets or the angle brackets have to vanish. I had two diagrams. One of them had to vanish. So in fact, by inspection, once you get good at this, you just say, oh yeah, it's zero. So that was a, that was a pretty easy diagram. Zero. So diagram A vanishes. Okay. So now let's do diagram B. I've got uh, 10 minutes, but I'm uh, getting faster and faster at this. Uh, be, because uh, w when you're located at a pole in the complex plane, so I drew this. I drew, you know, some diagrams. There's a pole here in the complex plane. I had two diagrams, A and then there was B. All right. And then uh, the difference between the two diagrams was the chirality. So one of them uh, was plus minus and the other one's minus plus. So what happens if I flip the chirality uh, what happens is, uh, in this case, this is square brackets. In this case, this, it's angle brackets. But it's the same pole. And in order for this to be on shell, either angles or squares have to vanish. So one of them will always vanish. Right. Uh, so it's not an accident. The fact I got zero is exactly what should have happened. Okay, that time it was my fault. 
Ah, no, there's a crack here. That Okay, so now we have diagram B. So we got to go compute that guy. So diagram B, again, uh, we can just write it down immediately in a usable form. By the way, the computer programs that use this, uh, they, never, uh, they never bother with any of this cleaning up and hat removal and all this other stuff. Uh, immediately, you just, this represents a picture of an amplitude uh, let's put this plus and minus. And this is known in terms of well-defined momenta in the complex plane, and you just use it directly. So, uh, in fact, as soon as I write this down, I have the answer. And uh, the answer, in this case, uh, is uh, minus i, and then there's 3, minus k2, 3. Let me put on some labels. Yeah, I think I got all my labels. Uh, the square, square on this side, 2, 3, uh, then minus k2, 3, okay, there's some hats here, okay, uh, 2, uh, and then I have, uh, okay, uh, I have basically this propagator here, that's 1 over uh, uh, s2, 3, and then I have uh, just reading off, there's a three-point amplitude here, uh, and then I have one, and then it's minus k14 uh, with a hat, and it's cubed, uh, 41 minus k14 with a hat, and then a 4. Okay, now, uh, at this point, I can declare a victory and say I just have the answer, I'm done. But you're going to look at it and say, but, but how do you know that's the right answer? <laughs> So that's what we need to do. We have to do hat removal again. By the way, this is how calculations in heaven go. You just write down the answer. You don't actually calculate it. Uh, but okay. Hmm? Uh, this is this hat here. It's it's z at the location of of the pole that I worked out. Sorry, where's the question? So can you just take z to zero? There is no z in here. I mean, z has been frozen to the location of the residue. So there is no z anymore. So this is a formula. This is now a formula for A at located at zero. It's in terms of this one diagram B, right? And that, in fact, is the answer, OK? Uh, now we have to go through the hat removal. So the hat removal, maybe uh, I have five minutes to, to do it, so I'll do it quickly and then uh, assign the homework. Uh, so the hat removal uh, gives, uh, gives us that this is equal to uh, 1 minus and then k2, 3 uh, without the hats, and k3 minus. By the way, if, he, if I see a k2, 3, so that's k2 plus k3, and there's actually slashes on here, and there's a slash on there, so I can in fact just get rid of that 3. It, doesn't, it just uh, gets annihilated uh, against that spinner, but let me just leave this uh, alone for a second. Uh, and then uh, I just have to do a little bit of algebra, so I'm doing it very quickly, just writing down the answer, but the it's just the substitution of those hat removal formulas. I'm not doing anything fancy. I have the hat removal formula. I just, whenever I see a hat, I just stick it in. Okay. And then uh, this thing here, what I do is, let me write it in terms of, uh, of spinners. Notice I wrote this in terms of momenta. And I told you momenta are bad. I don't like momenta. So I'm going to turn that into a spinner right here. Oops, that should be a square. Okay, and then uh, on the other side, I have to again go, uh, this is now times, uh, some more hat removal there. So that is, if I do that, I'm going to get um, uh, 1 minus, and then k14, and then 2 minus cubed. See, and then there's a 4, 1. 
So I'm not doing anything too fancy, just doing a little bit of algebra on the blackboard. Okay, 4 minus and then K14 and then 2 minus. Okay, and then next step, I go through here and I start cleaning up, like I noticed, as I pointed out, uh, the 3, the K3 against here gives me 0. I find similar things here, the K4 against here gives me, it gives me 0, the 1 against there gives me 0. So now I just clean it up, collect it. Uh, so if I do that, uh, I, I get, uh, well, I'm almost out of time. So I'm just going to uh, skip a step, but it, it's completely straightforward. Once you have uh, a 1 with a k slash with a 2, you just use the formula to rewrite that in terms of spinners. So I just rewrite it in terms of spinners and just clean it up just a little bit. Okay, and if I do that, I'm going to get that this is 1, 2. Oh, what the heck, why don't I just write it out? Okay, until the organizer uh, harasses me, I'm probably okay. So. Uh-huh, I'm being, uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't have said anything. Okay, <laughs> okay, I give up. So anyway, you just do a little bit of algebra. It's, it's, it's not very complicated. Um, anyway, you get this. Uh, and, and this is completely straightforward. I just use the case slashes and, and rewrite things in terms of spinners using the completeness relations. Um, and then uh, 2, 3, uh, 1, 2, 1, 3, and then 3, 2. Uh, this is squared, this is cubed. Okay, now this guy, he does not look like the Park-Taylor amplitude, right? Um, but have no fear. We're going to shake him. Uh, so let me just shake him right up here. We can take this, and I'm going to rewrite it uh, as a product of three things. This is equal to minus i. 1, 2 cubed divided by 2, 3, and 3, 4, 4, 1, and then uh, one term which I will write like this, 1, one 4, 4, 2 divided by 1, 3, 3, 2 uh, squared, and then times uh, another term, which is uh, 2, 4, uh, 4, 3, and then uh, 2, 1, and then 1, 3. Like so. And uh, from here to here is really nothing. All I'm doing is uh, just grabbing terms and, and putting them in a, you know, just like reshuffling them. Uh, so uh, if I've done this correctly, you should see you see the 4, 2? And there's two of them here, one of them there. You see three of them there, right? And et cetera for all the other terms. So it's just putting things together. But now let's have a look at this, this fellow right here. This guy, 2, 4. Let's look at uh, 2, 4. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, oh, there's something, yeah, no, oh, I know what I did wrong. Yeah, so let's look at 2, 4, 4, 3, right? This guy we can rewrite as uh, uh, as uh, 2 plus, or sorry, uh, squ as square 2, and there's a plus helicity here, and then k4 slash, and then uh, a 3 here with a plus. Maybe I'll write it like that. Now, there's momentum conservation, right? Momentum conservation says k4 is equal to minus k1 minus k2 minus k3. But the, K1, the, the k2 and the k3, they get annihilated here, so all I get is the k1. The k1, notice, is exactly what I have here. So, in fact, this term is just minus 1. And this term, if you go through the same argument, that's just one. And there you have it. I have the, the correct answer. So I've just derived the correct answer. So I've just proven to you it's a stupid crack. <laughs> See, it like jumps up, so I can only erase in this direction. If I erase in that direction, it grabs it for me. 
Okay, but anyway, I, I am done. Because uh, here's the answer. The answer is A, 1 minus, 2 minus, 3 plus, 4 plus is equal to I and then 1, 2 to the 4th divided by uh, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1. Okay, and that is the correct answer. Okay, now the homework assignment is do exactly the same thing at higher points. And here's the homework. You can pick it up uh, right after my lecture. Okay. I, I uh, stripped it away. Uh, they, they, um, it, it's actually in the color dressed formula. Uh, I, I just dropped the coupling constant. It's nothing, n nothing profound. I didn't get well. Uh, so in this approach, uh, we're starting from uh, scheduled amplitudes. And uh, we, uh, we have some Lagrangian or not. We do yeah. have some certain uh, interaction. Yes. We should have something. Well, we, we do have a Lagrangian, but we ignore it. The only thing we get out of the Lagrangian is the three-point interaction. So the Yang-Mills four-point interaction, for example, so is forgotten. Yes, yeah, so you need to know the three-point amplitude. But it turns out that the three-point amplitude I wrote down is the only possible thing you can write down. <laughs> so, so in fact, you know, you don't even need the Lagrangian to figure out what to write down. But, but anyway, that's another story. I mean, the, I mean, of course, we originally this came from the Lagrangian, but just only the three-point interaction. And uh, in my uh, next or couple lectures from now, uh, I'll show you the same trickery for gravity. Only the three-point interaction is the only thing you need to know to build up the entire S matrix. So this is for Yang-Mills. Yeah, the, so far Yang-Mills, but the homework, luckily, tells you to go do gravity. Okay, so you'll go do gravity. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's actually a very good question. Uh, there is a tension, but n or there was a tension, but no longer. Uh, now we have uh, six d six dimensional helicity formulations that are quite useful. Um, that actually was a big problem, but it's I'd say it's now under good control. No, 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 you do dimensional regularization or, or some other versions of regularization. But uh, it, it's done in terms of six-dimensional spinners, and then you do a, a dimensional reduction uh, for that. And that's something that is actually extremely important to us because um, if we quote an answer for uh, an amplitude and it's been integrated, and if you have not controlled the regularization properly, you will very likely get the wrong answer. And this, of course, leads to endless debates when you have hypothetical calculations instead of real ones. Right. So it's actually a very important problem, but, uh, but I'd say it's now under pretty good control. Right. Um, well, at tree level, if you chose it differently and you miss some poles, then uh, you'd just be wrong. Uh, and, but the, let's say if you go to loop amplitudes, the issue of the contour is there, there's a big problem. Here, the contour is, you know, it's pretty obvious. But at, at loop level, the, this issue of the contour is really crucial. I don't know if Nima will talk about the issue of the contour uh, at loop level. Um, but, but here there's really no issue. You just go off to infinity and do, choose a big contour. If you miss one residue, you have the wrong answer. Yeah, but how do you see that a priori that you're going to get the wrong answer? I mean, what, what uh, the, uh, It'll be if you do the shift in a different channel. 
you'll, you will then get the, a different answer. So in fact, uh, one of the ways that we know that uh, something is correct is, uh, you know, you do one shift and then you do another shift and you make sure you get the same answer. If you drop one residue in one answer and either you drop it or don't drop it in another one, you know, they will not agree. Yes. So you doubled it, you doubled it by some uh, spinner product. Um, is it essential that that spinner product uh, would not involve the momentum within the original one? I mean, if you had K12 hat and you want to remove, oh, sorry, K23, and you want the hat removed, yeah. was it essential to contract it with uh, a one hat? No, 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 no. It, it wasn't essential. It, it just, uh, you, don't, you don't need to do it this way. It's just that this is the fastest way to do the removal. Because if you don't do the removal the right way, the algebra becomes very opaque. And I would not be able to give this lecture. <laughs> and we get all of it, yes. <laughs> Uh, yes, I'm glad you asked that question. So uh, the Einstein action has an infinite number of interactions. Well, I'm here to tell you that as far as the S matrix is concerned, they are completely irrelevant. They have no physical information, no content whatsoever. Everything is in the three-point. And even better, it's in the on-shell three-point. You know, all this thing about the Donder gauge and the you know, complicated formulas, forget about that. Three-point on shell is all you need. In fact, that's the homework. So uh, you're, you're very, ha at least at tree level, you just do the homework, and then from the three-point, you can get the four-point, the five-point, the six-point, and then after a while, you get tired and you say, okay, I get the point. Okay. <laughs> so, so the Cartesian relation came from the Twisto formulation, but this new idea of going to complex momenta and, and this Z-variable, does it call for a formulation in terms of four? Four or five dimensional complex space? Well, uh, the, the, the history of how exactly this happened is actually very convoluted. Uh, maybe one example of the complete convolution is that it all went through loops. All this tree stuff was discovered by studying loop amplitudes. And, and yes, uh, you know, the, the CSW and the, all this, the twisters and all that was, played a role in all this, but it's so convoluted. In, Um, but it, it, Lagrangians inherently are, are not, from our point of view, a good way of looking at it. And the place to really see that is by looking at gravity. Because if you're looking at S matrix, scattering amplitudes, and perturbative gravity, you're, you're basically your soul is lost as soon as you touch that Lagrangian. Um, by the way, it turned out the first people to use complex momenta were uh, Sagnati and, um, and Gaurav who did the two-loop counter term of, of uh, gravity, which is a, a three-point function. And they realized that complex momentum is important, but what they didn't realize is that you should use Cauchy's theorem. But OK. okay just be careful. Yeah. Landau tried to bury the Lagrangian. It came back. So it could be. Don't bury it too early. Uh, actually, my joke is late at night. When no one is looking, we, we, we do look at the Lagrangian, and we do look at the Feynman rules. Uh, because Feynman rules have one thing that uh, you can't beat, and that's that we know it's correct, and every time there's a subtlety, anomalies, you know, dimensional regularization, whatever the subtlety is, you can always study the Feynman rules to make sure that you've done it correctly or that you understand it. So no, Feynman diagrams are not going away. Maybe people will use it uh, late at night. <laughs> It sure will be. So the, the most uh, complex case that I know of is uh, two to two scattering in QCD at two loops. So we did this using not this, but uh, the same on shell type ideas, and um, that you know de definite agreement. So Nigel Glover did uh, the calculation, and for this, there's enormous data comparing to all sorts of other ways of doing it. For example, the barons gill recursion relations, which is... is uh, but this is a different story. Yeah. You see, you did Lagrange. What exact formula? Now, of course, maybe you can reproduce the part of the Lagrangian. But 
Right. Right. I just don't believe that you can reproduce the whole result. Well, I only said, first of all, notice I only said scattering amplitudes. And for scattering amplitudes, it's true. If you have, uh, in uh, Yang Mills theory, if you have the three point functions, that is all you need on shell, that is all you need to construct the entire S matrix. The same for gravity. Right? And anyway, we, we can discuss more, but, but that's a true statement. But I'm only talking about scattering amplitudes. In fact, one of the big problems, I would say, is to take these ideas and push them out into other types of solutions, like classical solutions. Uh, I believe the Lagrangian will be extremely useful for that. But at least for scattering amplitudes, uh, I, I think uh, this is the right way. Okay. Uh, gravity. Gravity. No, well, I mean, gravity is also gauge. I mean, for example, for um, scalar fields. Well, uh, yeah, you can do it, but it, it's not going to be especially helpful. Uh, so you can definitely do this, because if you looked at what I used, n notice I used Cauchy's theorem. I used uh, factor, basic factorization, and then there was uh, something about large z behavior. As z goes to infinity, there has to be good behavior. Uh, basic, you can always set it up, e even in phi cube theory or, or phi to the fourth, but in those theories, this stuff isn't that helpful. It's really engaged theories where you really gain the power. So if you learned in the textbooks that the simplest quantum field theories are phi to the fourth and, and so on, or phi cube, those statements are wrong. The simplest quantum field theories are gauge theories and, and gravity. But you can set up a recursion. You can, you can set up a recursion. Um, I don't know if anybody did anything like this, but I can assure you there's nothing interesting about it. It's just not going to be very useful. It's only engaged theories that the full power of this, that this becomes very important. That, that, that problem of phi to the fourth theory or phi cube theory, it's inherently a mess. I mean, there's no gauge cancellations that we can exploit, that we really exploit in this. Uh, you sure can. Uh, there's uh, many papers on that. Um, notice that, uh, <coughs> well, I, I, used, I used massless here and I used massive, but again, notice that the basic ideas in the formalism, Cauchy's theorem, uh, I assume that applies as well to massive, and then also, you know, the basic factorization, and, and people have written many papers explaining how to use it.